Good morning. We will continue with our uh, Booker Prize winning novel, The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro, uh, published in 1989. Now, um, when we were talking about the book last time, we talked about the key ideas or the key words um, to understand the remains of the day. And uh, one is repression and self denial. The hero, Mr. Stevens, um, a butler in a great household, uh, Darlington Hall, belong, which belongs to Lord Dar Darlington. He, uh, he is so consumed by his desire to be a professional, uh, to be a consummate butler, that uh, he never bothers about what he wants about his own desires. It is always what, the, what, he, what is expected of him, what his employer expects of him. So, that in, the, in the process of fulfilling his master's wishes and desires, he resorts to uh, repressing and suppressing his own desires, his own wishes here, and even his own uh, beliefs and convictions. And this is the, the basic idea of uh, the remains of the day. Uh, the butler, in fact, remains a metaphor for, for sorry for those who remain unwaveringly loyal or unwaveringly uh, um, unquestioning towards their so-called masters or social and political superiors. So, this is one of the underlying ideas of the remains of the day, uh, which talks about uh, how, to what extent, to what lengths people. Sh uh, can go or should go to maintain the so called social equilibrium. Uh, another question uh, in the novel is uh, that is raised in the novel is uh, the idea or the question of dignity. Now, uh, when we were talking about the question of dignity, we saw how there was a Hayes society, Hayes society which defined what dignity is. And the membership was so exclusive that they would, uh, the, the, the society would admit only people, only those butlers who belong to the so called extremely distinguished households. Now, uh, there is a lot of debating on this issue or matter of dignity. And uh, um, Stevens uh, observes that uh, uh, dignity is a very fuzzy term, it is it's, uh, it's a very hard to define uh, expression. No one uh, really knows what true or great dignity is, uh, although one can easily define uh, what are the great households, you know, people who are born aristocrats or who have generations of wealth and social prestige uh, associated to them. But a great butler is someone who has the, uh, who has that elusive quality of acting uh, or, or rather displaying grace under pressure. And um, then he talks, I, mean, I am on page 61, um, let me make a reference to what he says. It was completely contrary to Lord Darlington's natural tendencies to take such public stances as he came to do. And I can say with conviction that his lordship was persuaded to overcome his more retiring side only through a deep sense of moral duty whatever may be said about his lordship these days, and the great majority of it is, as I say, utter nonsense. I can declare that he was a truly good man at heart, a gentleman through and through, and one I am today proud to have given my best years of service to. Now, we also talked about the uh, entire idea of Stevens being uh, an unreliable narrator. Now, what does that mean? Why can't we trust uh, Stevens? Uh, as a narrator, although we have only his voice, we uh, 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 just pay attention that he is the only one whose voice or whose point of view we actually get to find in the remains of the day. He is the na narrator, his is the voice that we hear. So, what makes him an unreliable narrator? The, the fact that he is consistently repressing and suppressing his true nature, he is uh, steadfastly uh, denying himself uh, all his pleasures and joys and happiness of life, because he professes to claim that 
uh, ideal of um, he, prefer, he desires to attain that ideal of dignity, uh, which makes him lead him to join the uh, you know that very exclusive, very minor circle of uh, uh, butlers who could really be defined as truly great. And therefore, in denying himself, in suppressing his true nature, in conforming to uh, uh, what is expected of him or what the society expects of uh, someone like Stevens, he becomes an unreliable narrator. So, when we see him talking about what, what people say about Lord Darlington and the way he justifies or defends his uh, former master, former because uh, it is established at the beginning that uh, Darlington Hall now belongs to an American gentleman, uh, Mr. Faraday, uh, Lord Darlington is no longer there. But, uh, Stevens still continues as the head butler of that great household. So, what I can declare that he was a truly good man at heart, a gentleman through and through, and one I am today proud to have given my best years of service to. The idea is that there are people who now condemn or who now question um, Lord Darlington about uh, several things that he has been involved in. Uh, uh, his role in history, for example, is one such issue, uh, one such major um, issue of contention. People, uh, uh, people talk and not always well of Lord Darlington and that is what bothers Mr. Stevens. Uh, even today, he is extremely loyal to his um, former master. So, um, we were talking about uh, Jeanette's uh, stylistic devices of order and duration. And again, we are now told much before what really happens that uh, Lord Darlington died unsung. Okay, Lord Darlington is no longer um, uh, uh, what he used to be. So, uh, this is again as, as the title itself reflects the remains of the days. So, uh, this uh, the remains of the days basically remains a novel which talks about uh, losses. There are several such losses in the novel and um, uh, the loss of Law Lord Darlington's reputation, his former prestige, his former uh, place in society is also one of the great losses that Stevens um, laments about and reflects over. P 63, uh, uh, we are still on, uh, now uh, as he reminisces about Lord da Darlington, while still in Salisbury, remember his motoring tour across the British countryside. And Lord Darlington, I should say, had actually witnessed my father's fall of a week or so earlier. Um, Miss Kenton has been worried about uh, old Mr. Stevens's uh, state of health. She also points out very uh, brusquely that Mr. Stevens is not what he used to be and uh, uh, Mr. Stevens the uh, junior should relieve his father of his duties as an under butler, which uh, uh, Mr. Stevens is too proud to uh, acknowledge. So, this gives you another glimpse uh, into uh, uh, Mr. Stevens character that he is too proud, he never acknowledges his mistakes and faults. So, a man who does not acknowledge his own faults, um, is not it rather uh, too much to expect that he would you know um, question or he would find faults with his employer, Lord Darlington, whom he, who, whom he is so loyal to or whom he um, is so devoted to. Okay. So, uh, this, this uh, uh, that entire uh, idea of uh, living in denial, self-denial as well as in uh, refusing to see where the fault exactly lies in himself as well as in Lord Darlington. So, P 63, Lord Darlington, I should say, had actually witnessed my father's fall of a week or so earlier. His lordship had been entertaining two guests, a young lady and gentleman in the summer house and had watched my father's approach across the lawn bearing a much welcome tray of refreshments. 
the lawn climbs a slope several yards in front of the summer house and in those days as today four flagstones embedded into the grass served as steps by which to negotiate this climb it was in the vicinity of these steps that my father fell scattering the load on his tray teapot cups saucers sandwiches cakes across the area of grass at the top of the steps so this is a calamity for others it may be uh, just another mishap an old man uh, uh, unable to negotiate his way up the stairs uh, but in lord darlington's great household this is uh, nothing short of a disaster and that too in front of uh, a company of guests so uh, uh, miss kenton's uh, prophecies at last come true uh, that old mr stevens indeed uh, deserves a much needed rest because he has sort of become uh, an embarrassment to lord darlington and the establishment um, and then uh, we are told that uh, mr stevens the uh, younger he is compelled to um, uh, rephrase his father's duties or reschedule his father's duties and no he is no longer given the responsibilities and charges that he was given earlier and in this also we uh, we realize that um, uh, uh, what kind of relationship uh, is shared between the father and the son uh, i'll just read you a couple of lines uh, mr stevens comes straight to his father's room uh, the quarters Uh, i have come here to relate something to you father then related briefly and con- concisely i haven't all morning to listen to your chatter in that case father i'll come straight to the point since you wish me to be brief i will do my best to comply the fact is father has become increasingly infirm so much so that even the duties of an under butler are now beyond his capabilities his lordship is of the view as indeed i am myself that while father is allowed to continue with his present round of duties he represents an ever present threat to the smooth running of this household and in particular to next week's important international gathering principally it has been felt that father should no longer be asked to wait at table whether or not guests are present now uh, look at the very formal and very uh, detached tone and manner in which um, the father and the son hold this conversation and nowhere does he refer to his father as you or you know with um, actual affection although there is lot of bo- there is lot of affection between the two men as we will later see but at this point it's uh, he addresses him extremely formally again as we have been seeing the uh, entire idea of repression of emotions because you are one is not supposed to reveal one is not supposed to express emotions because that's taken as a sign of weakness of character page 67 in fact i can describe his manner at that moment no better than the way miss canton puts it puts it in her letter it was indeed as though he hoped to find some precious jewel he had dropped there so it's like um, father once he is reassigned his duties he starts walking around extremely carefully he looks uh, he just stares at the uh, ground below at the floor and uh, never looks up okay and as uh, miss kenton later describes uh, uh, old mr stevens that the look the way he walked was as though he hoped to find some precious jewels he had dropped there and again this becomes a symbol this precious jewel what could it be it's is uh, it's those lo- lost times which will never come back the times of uh, old prestige and when mr stevens was at his at his peak um, uh, and uh, uh, at his peak of his uh, prestige and the so called dignity and which he he knows that it has been uh, uh, you know lost forever page 69 uh, but i feel uh, it's at the bottom but i feel i should return just a moment to the matter of my father 
for it strike me, strikes me, I may have given the impression earlier that I treated him rather bluntly over his declining abilities. The fact is, there was little choice but to approach the matter as I did, as I am sure you will agree once I have explained the full context of those days. So, now we are told what was so important about those days, why was it so uh, uh, pertinent that, uh, uh, that old Mr. Stevens should be uh, reassigned his duties. That is to say, the important international conference to take place at Darlington Hall was by then looming ahead of us, leaving little room for indulgence or beating about the bush. It is important to be reminded moreover, that although Darlington Hall was to witness many more e events of equal gravity over the 15 or so years that followed, that conference of March 1923. So, again that conference of that conference of March 1923, there are repeated reference to that particular event. Again, think uh, Gerard, Gerard, Gerard Janet's uh, uh, idea of uh, order and duration, where an, uh, an event is so important that before it actually happens, there are multiple references to it, just because of its magnitude. Okay. And this frequent re repetitions and uh, um, references add uh, that a touch of that much needed gravitas to the, uh, to the event, that it was uh, actually or really an, an event that was so important to everyone concerned. So, the event of March 1923, about the first one, uh, first one of them, one was, one supposes relatively inexperienced and inclined to leave little to chance. In fact, I often look back to that conference and for more than one reason, regard it as a turning point in my life. For one thing, I suppose I uh, do regard it as the moment in my career, when I truly came of age as a butler. So, this is a point when he realizes that he has almost touched upon the highest standards of perfection in his profession. Okay. He has almost joined the um, ranks of the great uh, butlers in the history of um, United Kingdom. And he feels that uh, March 1923, the conference period was one such time when he was at the peak of his powers, when he truly came of age as a butler. See, there are also undercurrents of irony and humor, although the humor is not very uh, boisterous, but there is also a, a, a sense, uh, you know, a very right touch um, of humor that uh, someone would be so proud of his uh, ability to serve some, uh, serve, uh, serve people, okay, and therefore coming. Uh, of age as a butler is something to be proud of. It may not be uh, um, for someone who is, uh, you know, growing up in current generation, but we are talking about 1920s and uh, uh, it also reflects on the social and political climate of those days. That is not to say I consider I became necessarily a great butler. It is hardly for me in any case to make judgments of this sort, but should it be that anyone ever wish to posit that I have attained at least a little of that crucial quality of dignity in the course of my career, such a person may wish to be directed towards that conference of March 1923 as representing the moment when I first demonstrated I might have a capacity for such a quality. It was one of those events, which at a crucial stage in one's development arrived to challenge and stretch one to the limit of one's ability and beyond, so that thereafter one has new standards by which to judge oneself. That conference was also memorable, of course, for other quite separate reasons, as I would like now to explain. Now, in describing repeatedly the the, uh, the magnitude of the conference, uh, Ishiguro is also raising our expectations, is also raising, um, you know, building up the suspense, what actually happened, okay, why was it so important and 
uh, what uh, what did Stevens exactly do uh, so that now he, as he looks back on his career as a butler, he regards March 1923 as uh, the height of his success when he was at the pinnacle of his professionalism. That conference was also uh, memorable of course, for other quite separate reasons as I would like now to explain. So, now we actually see what happened. The conference of 1923 was the culmination of long planning on the part of Lord Darlington. Indeed, in retrospect one can clearly see how his lordship had been moving towards this point from some three years or so before. As I recall, he had not been initially so preoccupied with the peace treaty when it was drawn up at the end of the great war. We are talking about the first world war 1914 to 1918 and um, Lord Darlington is uh, uh, an employee of the British government in the foreign services. And, uh, he must be one of those elite few who drew up the treaty of uh, Versailles, uh, where, where um, uh, the point where Germany was uh, um, you know, uh, you, uh, heavily defeated and was at the mercy of uh, uh, the allies. So, it was that at that point uh, that uh, Lord Darlington uh, started working immediately after the first world war. And I think it is fair, uh, sorry, fair to say that his interest was prompted not so much by an analysis of the treaty, but ha by his friendship with Herr Karl Heinz Bremen. Okay, so, uh, there is one German man, uh, yeah, gentleman um, who was a very good friend of uh, Mr. Steve, uh, sorry, Lord Darlington. And the idea is that Lord Darlington, who uh, was uh, an Englishman, a very honorable and decent English nobleman. He made uh, great friends with uh, uh, with Mr. Bremen, a, a German, you know, someone who comes who represents a defeated country. And uh, uh, later, uh, that it is realized that uh, the Treaty of Versailles was so humiliating for the German people and particularly for uh, Mr. Bremen that he ends up shooting himself because he uh, uh, holds himself responsible for the humiliation that his country suffered by signing that treaty. So, Lord Darlington moved by Mr. Bremen's suicide and also um, you know driven by his own sense of decency. He uh, plans a conference where uh, Germany can be given some sort of respite. So, it is it's a it's an it's a conference. It's an event of great magnitude, where uh, events or decisions of monumental importance would be taken. And uh, where does that leave our butler friend, Mr. Stevens, at the center of things? Because after all, he's going to manage the household where the conference is going to take place. So Lord Darlington may be an important man, but uh, the butler is going to run the show along with the household and therefore, he is no less important. Uh, we come to page 73. Um, it was a little later that same night that his lord, uh, that his lordship, that is Lord uh, uh, Darlington said with some gravity shaking his head, I fought that war to preserve justice in this world. As far as I understood, I was not taking part in a vendetta against the German race. So, this is what the uh, treaty appears to be a, a sort, sort of a, a vendetta. Okay, he, um, Lord Darlington's intentions are totally honorable and the, uh, his intentions or his uh, uh, willingness, his decision to help um, Germany has been spurred on by the suicide of his very dear friend and associate uh, Mr. Bremen. So, now uh, again memory, you know the remains of the day is a novel about memory, of memory and the, the, then on at this point Stevens reflects back again. And when today one hears talk about his lordship, when one hears the sort of foolish speculations concerning his motives as one does all too frequently these days, 
I am pleased to recall the memory of that moment as he spoke those heartfelt words in the near empty banqueting hall. Whatever complications arose in his lordship's course over subsequent years, I for one will never doubt that a desire to see justice in this world lay at the heart of all his actions. It was not long after that evening there came the sad news that her Berman, Bremen had shot himself in a train between Hamburg and Berlin. Naturally, his, lord, his lordship was greatly distressed and immediately made plans to dispatch, to dispatch funds and commiserations to Frau Bremen. However, after several days of endeavor in which I myself did uh, best to assist, his lordship was not able to discover the whereabouts of any of her Bremen's family. He had, it seemed, been homeless for some time and his family dispersed. So, uh, this is the reason that, uh, that uh, motivates Lord Wa Wa Darlington to help the German nation. Uh, page 77. Um, so, as the days of conference come, um, um, come nearby, uh, this is what Stevens tell us that this, uh, the, tells us that this is what he was doing. Uh, thus set about uh, preparing for the days ahead, as I imagine, a um, general might prepare for a battle. I devised with utmost care a special staff plan, anticipating all sorts of eventualities. I analyzed where our weakest points lay and set about making contingency plans to fall, fall back upon in the event of these points giving way. I even gave the staff a military style pep talk, impressing upon them that for all their having to work at an exhausting rate, they could feel great pride in discharging their duties over the days that lay ahead. History could well be made under this roof, I told them. And they, knowing me to be one not prone to exaggerated statements, well understood that something of an extraordinary nature was impending. Now, again, this is um, another, yet another instance of um, exaggeration. History would be made under this roof. Uh, you know, there is a, a sense of uh, too much uh, or excessive self-importance in both Lord Wa uh, Darlington as well as uh, Stevens. Um, they consider themselves or they take themselves too seriously. Uh, it is not like a group of people can mold or uh, inform the destiny of, um, uh, of Europe, but this is what they take themselves for that they are going to play a, a very significant part in the history of those times. And uh, at this also, Ishiguro hints, is, appears a little ridiculous to assume this sense of self-importance. Page 93, uh, where we are told that amidst all these preparations, because now the conference is in full swing and people of a great importance have arrived um, to Darlington Hall um, to discuss uh, the issue of uh, um, how much respite should Germany be, gi be given. So, uh, at the core of it is uh, the discussion of the terms of uh, the Treaty of Versailles. So, uh, while all this, all these activities are going on and there is so much of hustle and bustle in the household. Uh, senior Mr. Stevens falls seriously ill. Remember, he has already been ill. He was not in the best of health. He is 72, 72 years old. And then, um, maybe all this workload and activities, they do not agree with him and uh, he falls ill. So, what happens then? Um, he has, we are told that he just keels over and he, uh, his eyes were closed, his eye face was an ashen color and there were beads of sweat on his forehead. Further assistance was called, a bath chair arrived in due course and my father was transported up to his room. Once my father had been laid in his bed, it was a little uncertain as to how to proceed, because Stevens uh, bears on his shoulders the weight of the world. Um, he is extremely uh, aware 
of the monumental task that, uh, that is uh, spread in front of uh, Lord Darlington and he wishes to serve his master in uh, to the best of his capacity. So, uh, even at the, uh, at the risk of neglecting his own father, because that is what has been ingrained in him uh, from the beginning uh, by his father that one must do one's duties to perfection and therefore, he, the kind of pride that Mr. Stevens takes in his profession, uh, it prevents him from uh, taking more emotional decisions like looking after his father. Once my father had been laid in his bed, I was a little uncertain as to how to proceed. For while it seemed undesirable that I leave my father in such a condition, I did not really have a moment more to spare. As I stood hesitating in the doorway, Miss Canton appeared at my side and said, Mr. Stevens, I have a little more time than you at the moment. I shall, if you wish, attend to your father. I shall show Dr. Meredith up and notify you if he has anything no noteworthy to say. So, uh, Miss Canton, who was quite miffed with Mr. Stevens and his uh, uh, overbearing ways, she proves to be uh, a person with uh, uh, a real emotional uh, core because why she understands, although she understand, uh, understands Mr. Stevens' situation also, she knows how devoted he is to his duties and to Lord Darlington. And therefore, she says that she, uh, she is going to look after his father while he can go and attend to his duties. Thank you, Miss Kenton, I said and took my leave. So, again as we talk about uh, uh, the entire idea of self uh, deception all under the garb of uh, unquestioning loyalty and uh, uh, all this to just preserve uh, or you know to uphold the notion of dignity all this at what cost at at the cost of one's own uh, real feelings and emotions and relationships when i returned to the drawing room a clergyman was uh, talking about the hardships being suffered by children in berlin I immediately found myself more than occupied replenishing the guests with tea and coffee. A few of the gentlemen I noticed were drinking spirits and one or two despite the presence of the two ladies had started to smoke. I was, I recall, leaving the drawing room with an empty teapot in my hand when Miss Kenton stopped me and said, Mr. Stevens, Dr. Meredith is just leaving now. As she said this, I could see the doctor putting on his Macintosh and hat in the hall and so went to him, the teapot still in my hand. The doctor looked at me with a disgruntled expression. Your father is not so good, he said. If he uh, deteriorates, call me again immediately. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, that is all that comes out of Mr. Stevens, so preoccupied with dis discharging his duties. Uh, um, We will move on to page 104 and now uh, we find uh, the cook, Mrs. Mortimer, um, uh, who again comes back and uh, informs uh, Mr. Stevens that his father is uh, really going very bad. Oh, Mr. Stevens, she said upon our entry, is gone very poorly. Indeed, my father's face had gone a dull reddish color like no color I had seen on a living being. I heard Miss Kenton say softly behind him, his pulse is very weak. I gazed at my father for a moment, touched his forehead slightly, then withdrew my hand. In my opinion, Mrs. Mortimer said, he has suffered a stroke. This is most distressing. Nevertheless, I must now return downstairs. So, this is what he calls grace under pressures, um, uh, pressure courage under suffering okay. and this is what he has been trained uh, to do and uh, while he performs his duties amidst such uh, severe personal trauma, uh, he actually takes great pride in what he is doing. Of course, Mr. Stevens, I will tell you when the doctor arrives or else um, when there are any changes. Thank you, Miss Kenton. I hurried down the stairs and was in time to see the gentleman proceeding into the smoking room. The footman looked relieved to see me and I immediately signaled them to get to their positions. 
Whatever had taken place in the banqueting hall after my departure, there was now a genuinely celebratory atmosphere among the guests. All around the smoking room, gentlemen seemed to be standing in clusters, laughing and clapping each other on the shoulder. Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis's character is also very important. He represents the United States of America. And uh, uh, the United States of America had also played a very important role in the First World War and uh, in the Treaty of Versailles. So, now um, when uh, a discussion is uh, in progress about uh, reviewing the treaty, uh, we have the uh, character of Mr. Lewis, who is who later will know plays a very important part in the whole situation. Uh, Mr. Lewis, so far as I could ascertain, had already retired. I found myself making my way through the guests, a, a bottle of port upon my tray. I had just finished serving a glass to a gentleman, uh, when a voice behind me said, Ah, Stevens, you are interested in fish, you say? I turned to find the young Mr. Cardinal beaming happily at me. I smiled also and said, Fish, sir? When I was young, I used to keep all sorts of tropical fish in a tank, quite a little aquarium it was. I say, Stevens, are you all right? I smiled again. Quite all right, sir. Thank you. I felt something touch my elbow and turned to find Lord Darlington. Stevens, are you all right? Yes, sir. Perfectly. You look as though you are crying. I laughed and taking out a handkerchief, quickly wiped my face. I am very sorry, sir. The strains of a hard day. So consumed is Stevens by his professional duties that uh, he, uh, he is totally unaccepting of his grief. Uh, he does not accept his grief or admit his grief um, even to himself, okay, leave alone confiding in a friend. So, at the end of the novel, that is what we find that uh, he is left with uh, no real friends, only uh, memories of a profession, a great profession, a great career indeed, but uh, uh, no real emotional attachments. That is because he himself wanted his life this way. So, in his inability or inability to confess to himself his own real emotions, he becomes an unreliable narrator. So, when he, uh, 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 this can also be seen in the uh, pol political context, when he defends Lord Darlington's position, we cannot trust him or we cannot rely on him completely, because we know that we, here we are looking at a person who has not been true to his own nature, who has refused to accept the true nature of his employee out of unwavering uh, loyalty and sense of duty. So, uh, therefore, Stevens is an unreliable narrator. We move on uh, to page uh, 109. We find that, uh, much to uh, everyone's dismay, old Mr. Stevens passes away. Uh, and although um, Stevens is attending to his guest's needs and uh, um, trying to conduct, uh, you know, small talk with all his all the guests in the Darlington Hall, um, he leaves his own father unattended. Uh, unattended in the sense that although there is Miss Ken uh, Kenton and the doctor is there to look after him, still. Uh, he is not there in person to see his father during his uh, uh, dying moments. And this is something that he had to learn to live with. But uh, in spite of the tragedy, he looks back at the um, entire event with great pride, as we are told at the beginning, that this was a time when he feels that he had reached or almost touched that uh, precious quality of uh, dignity and of uh, what is what it actually means to be a great butler. So, after his father's death, of course, it is not for me to suggest that I am worthy of um, ever being placed alongside the likes of the great butlers of our generation, such as Mr. Marshall or Mr. Lane. So, look at the number of times he refers to Mr. Marshall and Mr. Lane, the great butlers, you know, and who defines them or who ranks these butlers. Um, yeah, these uh, very elitist kinds of magazines like uh, 
like uh, the Hay Society okay, and the kind of newsletters they run. So, it is there that these uh, people are admired and they are ranked as the great ones. And look at the number of times he refers to these great ones and he also very modestly uh, proclaims that um, I am not suggesting that I am worthy of ever being placed alongside these great personages. That means, at the bottom of his heart, uh, somewhere the, uh, in his mind, there is this uh, desire to equal uh, these greats, to join the ranks of these, the so called great and dignified uh, butlers. Though it should be said, um, there are those who perhaps out of misguided generosity tend to do just this. They say that, you know, uh, he says that there are some people who actually believe that I am one of the last great butlers of this generation, but I think this is, our, they are being magnanimous. Stevens himself is being very uh, modest. It could even be a case of fake or false modesty, but then he does not want to say so himself that he was a great butler. Let me make clear that when I say the conference of 1923 and that night in particular constituted a turning point in my professional development, I am speaking very much in terms of my own more humble standards. Even so, if you consider the pressures contingent on me that night, you may not think I delude myself unduly if I go so far as to suggest that I did perhaps display in the face of everything, at least in some modest degree, a dignity worthy of someone like Mr. Marshall or uh, come to that my father. Indeed, why should I deny it? For all its uh, sad associations, whenever I recall that evening today, I find I do so with a large sense of triumph. So, this again, while choosing the this uh, uh, elusive quality of uh, or chasing this elusive quality of uh, dignity, he deceives himself, he denies himself the, uh, the, the basic emotions, the basic human feelings, the basic joys of life. And this is a consistent feature of Stevens life. Okay, in order to be, be uh, the ultimate in dignity and professionalism, he ceases to be uh, true human being. So, therefore, he is as we, uh, we have been talking about all this while that what makes Mr. Stevens an unreliable narrator is because is uh, precisely this reason that a person who is not true um, to his own feelings, who lives in a state of denial cannot be trusted entirely. We move on to next uh, chapter that is day two afternoon, Mortimer's pond Dorset. Um, and then uh, there is a lovely little description of the British, of the sorry, the English countryside. Eventually, however, after some searching, I found a sign post to Mortimer's Pond, and so it was that I arrived here at this spot a little over half an hour ago. I now myself find, uh, I now find myself much indebted to the Batman for quite aside from assisting with the ford, he has allowed me to discover a most charming spot, which it is most improbable I would ever have found otherwise. The pond is not a large one, a quarter of a mile around its perimeter perhaps, so that by stepping out to um, any promontory, one can command a view of its entirety. An atmosphere of great calm pervades here. Trees have been planted all around the water, just closely enough to give a pleasant shade to the banks, while here and there clusters of tall reeds and bulrushes break the water surface and its still reflection of the sky. So, landscape is also calm and peaceful and very serene almost what Mr. Stevens uh, actually is on the surface, extremely calm, full of restraint and, uh, understa and you know, un uh, understated dignity. So, this is what he admires. So, perhaps this kind of uh, an English countryside 
becomes a metaphor uh, for uh, um, Mr. Stevens temperament, okay. the external reflects the in internal, that he, he is like this largely because of, of his time and of his uh, um, circumstances, the environment around him. So, we are not given to wild emotions, the raging passions, okay. the nature itself is so. So, how can human beings um, give themselves to uh, their desires? My footwear is not so much as to permit me easily to walk around the perimeter. I can see even from where I now sit, the path disappearing into areas of deep mud. But I will say that such is the charm of this spot, that on first arriving, I was solely tempted to do just that. Only the thought of the possible catastrophes that might befall such an expedition and of sustaining damaging to my travelling suit persuaded me to content myself with sitting here on this bench. And now look here, this is a beautiful sentence which sort of gives you the key to Mr. Stevens' character. He is not the kind of man who wants to come out of his comfort zone. Okay. There is a beautiful uh, area surrounding the lake, but it is slightly muddy. And Mr. Stevens is not the kind of person who would like um, even uh, a little bit of damage, a little bit of sand on his clothes or mud on his clothes. So, uh, while he would like to do that, so it is basically you know a glimpse of his character. He is not the kind of person who would ever take any risk. Okay. The risk, because he has been, uh, you know, brainwashed and he has been so conditioned or he has conditioned himself to live in a state of denial, to deny himself the basic joys. Walking uh, around, uh, around a, po a pond uh, barefooted is a very simple basic joy of life, that he denies himself even this much, because it would sully or it spoil his traveling suit. So, how do you expect such a man to plunge into something as wild as uh, uh, an emotional relationship? And he is not the kind of person who would do that. It is no doubt the quiet of these surroundings that has enabled me to ponder all the more thoroughly these thoughts, which have entered my mind over this past half hour or so. Indeed, but for the tranquility of the present setting, it is possible I would not have thought a great deal further about my behavior during my encounter with the Batman. That is to say, I may not have thought further why it was that I had given the distinct impression I had never been in the employ of Lord Darlington. For surely, there is no real doubt that is what occurred. He had asked, you mean you actually used to work for that Lord Darlington? And I had given an answer which could mean little other than that I had not. It could simply be that a meaningless whim had suddenly overtaken me at that point. This is the whole point is that uh, uh, a traveler asks Mr. Stevens whether he, where he comes from. And when Stevens uh, admits that he comes from the great Darlington Hall, he asks him if he was in, ever in the service of the great Lord Darlington. And the un our unreliable narrator says that he is actually in the employment of one Mr. Faraday. So, why does he deny, why does he deny that he has ever been in the employment of Lord Darlington, in spite of having such great uh, affection and such a great sense of loyalty towards his former employee. He does not even acknowledge the presence of La Lord Darlington in his life. So, perhaps there what we are witnessing is, uh, you know, a deep seated uh, uh, kind of a resentment against Lord Darlington, but which uh, Stevens being what he is, is too scared to even admit or to confront. So, what it is we will continue uh, in our next class. Thank you very much.